Hi guys, welcome to another, another Monday night study. Um, tonight, what we wanted to do, uh, about three weeks ago, I did a teaching on Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. And then since then, I think we've done a couple uh, on prophecy. But I've got a lot of questions uh, on that particular teaching, just people wanting clarification or more to the story. So I thought we would stop and go through some of that tonight. So we'll just have some general questions that came in through email uh, and actual mail, things like that. And then we'll go over to the chat room and see if there's any questions there. So just to kind of recap uh, some of this stuff, let's, uh, well, what I did three weeks ago, uh, or first off, I guess I should say, uh, next week is our Takufa, next Tuesday. So if you're following that kind of stuff, according to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, uh, four times a year on the solstices and the equinoxes, you get together with family, kind of like a Thanksgiving, talk about repentance, talk about prophecy, and then uh, feast with your family. And so we tend to do, we try to do that every quarter. So that'll be coming up next week. The following week is Christmas. So that's pretty neat. Um, okay, so three weeks ago, we were doing a basic teaching and basically we, we covered a lot of ground but mainly only to dwell, to dwindle it down to a couple of questions. Number one is in Genesis 6, when it talks about the sons of God and the daughters of men, there, there's four basic theories on what those are. One is that the sons of God are angels. Others that they're just rulers of, of that particular land. Others are that it's Sethites specifically and Canaanites, you know, two different major human clans. And then I forget what the fourth one is, but there's four different theories. And what we did is we looked at the Targum. And the Targum made it very, very clear that it was angels, specifically two angels in, in particular, and gave us more detail. Um, or just mentioning them, but those angels are given in a lot of detail in the Book of Enoch. So some questions came up about Enoch and, and things like that. So let me show you what we're talking about. If we went to... Uh, just real briefly to recap, in Genesis chapter 6, it talks about, and here's, here's verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days, after, and also after that, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they bore children. And so we were saying what this is meaning is that there were giants, or Nephilim is what it is, uh, when the angels of God, plural, there's a group of angels that came to the daughters of men. So it started at a certain point with Azazel, one angel, and then slightly later, uh, after that original incident, uh, son, more sons of God, plural, came and did the same thing. And this is what caused great wickedness and destruction. And Moses, when you're looking at Genesis, we've got to remember the first six or seven chapters goes from creation to the flood. And that's 1,656 years. That's a long time uh, to cover history in six pages, basically. And so we know that Moses is doing a quick recap. This is what happened. Here's the basic ideas. Here's the chronology. And then going forward. Um, so what we did was, you'd asked about the Targums. And Targum, we have an original Hebrew, Masoretic text. And there's a Septuagint, and then there's Dead Sea Scrolls, and then other things in other languages. Uh, and it's just the text. So the text, if it's faithful, says exactly the same thing as it does here. The Targums, on the other hand, it started in the time of Ezra, and it's a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Aramaic. What had happened is they'd went to Babylon uh, for a time, for 70 years, that's like well over one generation. So when they come back, they're used to speaking, reading, and writing Aramaic, which is very similar to Hebrew, but enough that it's confusing. Much like people today would tell me, I get confused when I read a King James, an old King James. Well, it's 400-year-old English. It's the type of thing that if you just stop and think about it a minute and reread it a couple times, you'll get it. Uh, it's not that hard, but it, it would be nice to have a, an easy, really easy to read fresh English translation, which is why most people go with something else. But same kind of a thing with Aramaic and Hebrew. 
So when we flip over to the targums, here's uh, my compiled targums, basically. And you can see here's verse 2 and verse 3 has got a whole lot of extra information. What they did is they would give you the information and then add commentary to it. So it says, uh, <clears throat> and this is the text, um, and you can tell it's a difference in spelling somehow, but this is uh, Shemyaza and this is Azazel, as mentioned in the Book of Enoch. But it's mentioning specifically two uh, angels, and it says, these two angels fell from heaven and were on the earth in those days. And also after when the sons of the great, sons of God, came to the daughters of men and basically that whole story. So this is interesting. So in, from, from a Targum standpoint, they're giving us extra information, the names of two angels. So number one, that tells us that the sons of God are angels. And this story is basically how that whole thing got started. So we look at the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, and then comments from church fathers, ancient rabbis, to kind of fill in the gaps to a lot of the stories. And so uh, another good example of this, reasons why you'd want to look at Targums occasionally anyway. Um, and I'll mention this in Genesis. We're in Genesis here, but in chapter, I think it's 35. Um, and let me find out where that's at. Let me just a second, because we're going to look at these questions here in a minute. Genesis 35, 21. Let me go back here. So in 35, verse 21, uh, it says, and I'll, I'll flip over to the King James first, 25 or 35, 21. And all it says here is that Israel, that's Jacob, journeyed. He took, picked up and, and moved, basically. He journeyed and he spread, or spread rather his tent beyond the Tower of Edar. So there's a famous place called the Tower of Edar. It's where they used to watch sheep. Uh, and maybe other things. So it's a famous place. And he went there and then actually went even beyond it. He, you know, left the area. But the Targum makes this really interesting comment. And the Targum says, Jacob, or Israel, proceeded and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edar, the place from whence it is to be that the King Messiah will be revealed at the end of days. Now, this term end of days means end of an age. And we could be talking about the end of their age, which is first coming, or the end of our age, which is second coming, or the end of the millennium, which is, you know, the end of everything. So we're talking about this. But notice this is really interesting because at the Tower of Edar, which is around the area of Bethlehem, where they would uh, uh, watch the sheep, that is where King Messiah would first be revealed at the end of their age. And so when we look at Matthew and we see that there were shepherds abiding their fields, out of, flocks out in the fields by night, and angels came and announced to them, tonight the Messiah is born. And they went and found him. It says they found the, babes, uh, the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So what's interesting to me is this is exactly that. So we're talking about Jacob went by this place and then they interject this. Oh, by the way, this is the place when the Messiah is born at the end of our age. Uh, he will first be revealed. And he was by the angels to the shepherds because that's the only people that'd be out there in this area would be shepherds. And that's exactly what the text says. So this is an example of an unbelieving Jew if this was written much, much later, would not put this in because it fits ja uh, Matthew too well. So why is this put in there unless it's something from a long time ago, something from one of the prophets? So it's just an example. This means nothing to us. Uh, I mean, it doesn't tell us anything new, but it's just kind of an interesting clue. So when you see these kind of things, you kind of wonder if... The rest of the information is that way. Now, that doesn't mean that some of the information in here could be wrong. Take it like it's a study Bible. So you've got the, the actual Bible, and then usually we have the commentary down at the bottom. In this case, it's all kind of put in verse by verse. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. 
So if we go to um, the questions, <clears throat> uh, first question is, where can we get the Targum that talks about the fallen angels? That's what we just read about. That Targum, if you go to uh, the Bible Facts website, this is our BibleFacts.org, and under uh, files right here, we have uh, eSword files. And that's what I use, eSword. So I've got a lot of things converted into it. So if you click on that, uh, these two in red up here, this is eSword.net. So you can get the eSword program if you want it. Um, it's free and it's a really good Bible program. And BibleSupport.com is a place where they make modules for eSword, MySword, uh, Crosswire, and several other Bible problems. Uh, things. So anyway, so those are actual sites off of here. But in here, if you go all the way down to the bottom right here, this one is targum.bblx. So it's a Bible. And basically all it is is Genesis through um, Deuteronomy, the, the, the Torah itself. That's what I have. But all the extra stuff is in there. So if you have eSword, you can click on this, download it, put it in there. Another thing that people ask me about a lot is this one here. The TRI, it's an interlinear. And the nice thing about it is you've got the Greek and then the, to the side, it's got the English, but it's also got the, the tense, the mood, the voice, all the parts of speech. Uh, and that comes in really handy sometimes. Uh, for instance, most of us know in, uh, in the book of Jude, it talks about um, all the bad examples and it gives you several examples. And then it talks about uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in like manner went after strange flesh. And you look at that, and in Greek, it's either masculine, um, neuter, or feminine, and it's either singular or plural. And what's nice about it is, because you're looking at that, does that refer to angels? Does that refer to the other you know, the three or four different things mentioned there? The only one that's masculine in that case that can refer to that is the angels that sinned and left their first estate. And so it's interesting that Jude is basically talking about the Genesis 6 account, the angels that left their first estate that metamorphosized into whatever form they're in now and was stuck there and caused all these problems. Anyway, so the TRI is a really cool thing that you can look at just to kind of see how it works. And the Targum is here. So... <clears throat> that's where we can get get it anyway so that was the first question second question is in your book fallen angels you wrote that azazel was uh, the leader of the second rebellion but in one of your podcasts you indicated he was the first to fall before the 200 angels and that seems contradictory so yeah that i'm I, that would seem contradictory basically this is the way it that it, it goes satan or Lucifer and his angels fell before Adam was created in the Garden of Eden. And he's the one, uh, the, the fallen angels and, or someone from his group that tempted Eve. And we had the fall of humanity. So there's a f angelic fall before the fall of humanity. But then according to Enoch, uh, Jubilees, the church fathers and others, basically about 600 years later, four to 600 years, there was an, one angel separate from Satan's group that came to earth. His name was Azazel, and he started doing genetic experiments. He kind of wanted to create his own thing, race, group of people, create his piece of heaven on earth, so to speak. He did this off to the side somewhere. I don't know if it was on an island or where it was, but it didn't bother anybody else. It was just him over in one place. So because it didn't cause any major problems, it looks like you could probably get away with doing something like that. So then there were 200 angels that descended, according to the book of Enoch, on Mount uh, Hermon and took an oath to do the same thing. But they went different places and did all the stuff that they did. There's actually a, a good amount of records to that. Um, and so that's what caused all the corruption. So when judgment was passed on the angels in general, <clears throat> the command was to uh, point basically the, the source of the, all this problem is Azazel. And so that's basically what happened. 
So what I was probably saying is um, the very first angelic rebellion is Lucifer. The second is Azazel. The third is Shemyaza and the 200. And then if there are any others, we don't know, but there's three. So I was probably trying to say that out of forgetting about Satan or Lucifer, the angels that came down to do genetic tampering, there were two groups, the first and the second. And so I may have mis misspoke or whatever, but that's what I was trying to say. So, um, and that's, yeah, we have that in fallen angels. So Azazel is the first, and Azazel is the one where the ritual of the scapegoat comes from. In King James, if you look up in uh, Leviticus, the ritual of the scapegoat, King James says scapegoat, but if you look up the Hebrew, it says Azazel. So this is actually an ancient memory to what Azazel did and the binding and the punishment and things like that. Ah, so um, that's the answer to number two. Number three is, is Azazel the same thing as the Antichrist? Um, in the ritual form, it could point to that. Just like the king of Tyre, the king of Egypt, the king of um, uh, Assyria, the king of Syria, and uh, I think there's a couple of others, uh, king of Babylon, all kind of point to the Antichrist. They're not incarnations of the Antichrist or anything. They're just maniacal idiots, basically. You could probably say the same thing Hitler might have been a good example of an Antichrist or a type of Antichrist. But he's not the Antichrist. He wasn't possessed by the Antichrist, you know, that kind of thing. So Azazel did something that tried to mess things up or started a process that might have messed things up. Um, so that ritual may teach us something about the Antichrist. We'd have to go back to uh, Leviticus and find out. But no, he's not, not the Antichrist. Um, okay, so number four. In your book, Fallen Angels, you said Azazel cohabited with Nema, Lamech's daughter. <clears throat> and that the children were known as Sedim. Where can we find more? Where can we find out more about the clans, the different groups? Um, let's see. Those specifically that the Sedim are his children is a legend among um, the from the Talmud and other things. When we put together fallen angels, what we wanted to do is start off with what we know biblically. Uh, from the Bible, from church fathers, and then from ancient rabbis. Nothing from Islam or anything else, just those basic sources. And so we put together, I think the first three chapters were about uh, the fall of Lucifer, second chapter, the fall of Azazel, and third chapter, the fall of uh, Shemyaza and the 200. So just kind of a synopsis. And then we had more information in it. The second part of the book is basically just a dictionary of, you know, what you where you'd look up Azazel or Sadim or whatever and find out about them. So some of that stuff comes from those literature and then others comes from the Talmud. So things from the Talmud, we're not absolutely sure 100 percent accurate, but we want them in there as something to be able to research. Um, and then stuff from, of course, from the Bible, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from the church fathers. Church fathers aren't 100 percent accurate either. But they're pretty close, I would think. Especially the church fathers that say they got their information from the apostles directly, the second generation. So that's really important to look at. So, yeah, we have that. So it, what's interesting to, with this, though, this word here, Sedim, in modern Hebrew just means ghosts. So like if granddad died and then came back, it would be a ghost of my grandfather, that kind of idea. So Sedim means ghost. In ancient Hebrew, very ancient Hebrew, though, uh, you know, ghosts are thought of as demonic. Demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Human beings, when they die, they go to they go to uh, Hades to await judgment, or they go to now anyway after Christ's resurrection, they go to be with the Father. So they're not running around on earth doing stuff. So an, a spirit can masquerade or look like a person, an angel, um, a grandfather, a animal, whatever, uh, masquerade as an alien form, you know, UFO alien or something, uh, to make you look, think that's what it is. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that concept. Now, Nema, this is interesting to hear because there were two Namas. 
One was the daughter of Enoch. She was the one that married uh, Noah, who was Noah's wife. A uh, great lady, uh, prophetess, like a lot of them were at the time of, the, of that group. Uh, Nama Lamech's daughter was known to be somewhat evil. Uh, we don't know that much about it. There's no specifics. It's just that she wasn't the greatest, not just because she was on Cain's side. You know, it's it's not genetic or anything else. But that whole concept of um, uh, the angels taught them things and the things the things that happened. Now, in the book of Enoch, in the first few chapters, it well, the first six chapters is all about the judgment that comes at the second coming. And it's specifically written according to the text for the people in the tribulation period. So that's why it's important that we have that now. After that, though, chapters like 6 to 20 or something like that is the history of the Nephilim, the clans and everything. And then uh, <coughs> there's prophetic things and, the, uh, and some things deal with the demonic in the back of the book. So anyway, yeah, that's that's what happened with that, with that one. So it's not the same lady that married Noah. It's a different lady by the same name. And uh, their children or whatever were, were known as Sedim. Okay, where can we find out more about the clans? Um, that's specifically mentioned, well, Enoch and Jubilees both, but Jubilees talks about the major clans. What had happened is when God sent judgment on this, there's no way people can do anything. So God had to send judgment. So you, you see all the way through the Old Testament, this whole concept of dividing the enemy. God will, you know, maybe a group of people come against the Israelites to destroy them. God will confuse the enemy and have one half of them think the other half is Israel. And so the two enemies will attack the same enemy, but the two sides will attack each other and basically annihilate themselves. And so you see that over and over again. You, you, you'll see the same thing in the Gog Magog War. According to Ezekiel 38, that same kind of a scenario happens. Um, so anyway, the Lord did the same thing back then. Uh, according to Jubilees, there were three major clans. Now, this would be like, you know, I, I don't know if they were wiped out beforehand or any or what exactly. But basically, there were angels and angels produced children. And those were Nephilim or giants. Then there were Nephilim, which are like a subgroup, and then there were something called the Elu, according to Jubilees. Now, remember, though, the book of Jubilees, the only full version we have is in the Ethiopic. So a lot of times names and numbers get corrupted. So that doesn't necessarily mean the Elu or Nephilim or whatever is exactly what it's supposed to be uh, from that language. And so, okay. And also with the word Nephilim, um, a lot of us thought it was, nephal means to fall. So like a past tense verb means to fall. So Nephilim would be fallen ones. But again, this is how it's, uh, that goes back to that idea of Hebrew and Aramaic. The word Nephalia in, in Aramaic means giant. Nephilim is probably the equivalent of Nephalia. Like um, Ben means son, but you have a bar mitzvah. Bar means son also. Bar is Aramaic for son, Ben is Hebrew for son. So just slightly different. But anyway, we're talking about the Nephilim. There's also Raphaim, Anakim, and others that are subgroups. Um, okay, so later, so we're the clans, basically Jubilees. Uh, later you state the Sedim were called lower angels by the Assyrians and others. Um, yeah, and I think... It, and the, the question basically was saying that was confusing. Um, they're not angels. They're demons. Um, they're not guardian spirits, although they were talked about by these people. So in other words, uh, when you've got a group of people that worship false gods or worship demons or think the demons are angels or something like that, that's what's going on. So these spirits never became angels. They never did anything like that. They stayed where they're at. The story from Jubilees is that after the Nephilim clans were all wiped out through the flood, we have demonic presence and demons can possess people. Demons can manifest in different ways and they were causing lots of problems. 
um, if I talk to you about accepting Christ as your savior and you went home and some other spirit appeared to you just out of the blue and said, Ken is an idiot. He worships a fake God. Follow me. I'll give you whatever. That would be kind of hard not to because you're seeing something. Okay. And so in the beginning, we had a lot of demonic activity. And according to Jubilees, um, Noah had prayed and asked the Lord to fix the problem. So the Lord took nine tenths of the demonic host, the evil spirits, and chained them. Uh, so we only have one tenth to roam the earth and do the stuff that it does. So if you've had any kind of demonic problem, uh, poltergeist or possession or someone in your family is been oppressed and it's obviously something supernatural it would be demonic or nephilim spirits this is interesting if you think about it because during the tribulation period uh, according to revelation that the the pit is opened the demonic locust come out or the ones that look like locust in in the description there in chapter i think it's chapter nine but basically that means during the during the tribulation period we're going to have 10 times the, the amount of demons roaming the earth, which means 10 times the demonic problem, 10 times the demonic activity. So you really, really do not want to be here during the tribulation period. So anyway, but that, that's, that's the basic story from Jubilees, from, from um, Enoch, and then the church fathers. Church fathers will occasionally just tell you stuff, and it's really interesting to, to listen to them. They have this general rule, though. Uh, the church fathers normally do not write down really specific stories if it has to do with sexual intercourse um, or the demonic. Not that they go together or anything, but it's just, it's not proper to talk about that in mixed public, that kind of a thing. And that's probably wise. It's probably better to, to deal with those kind of things in private counseling so if you have a demonic problem you'd go to your pastor the pastor would come to your house or do something we don't necessarily need to get the entire church involved or if there's some sort of an affair or something sexual same kind of thing it, if it can be taken care of private it should be but the only bad thing of that that's safer for people Bad thing about it is when we're reading the church fathers and they tell you, you know, that kind of thing that we don't talk about. And I'm like, I no, I don't. You need to be more specific. And so there's certain things that I wish the church fathers would have at least written down in a private counseling book or something like that. Anyway, so um, another question is what happened to Nema? Well, according to uh, Enoch, the book of Enoch, uh, when the judgment occurred, the judgment occurred to cause a civil war and they were all wiped out. The uh, demons, the angels and the wives of the angels are all put in a place called Tartarus. And this is the one that Peter is referring to, I think, in Second Peter. Um, the only place that's mentioned in scripture is the word Tartarus. Um, but anyway... Uh, so Nema being, if Nema is actually the wife or the one that worked with Azazel, then she would be there with him. So not in the normal place for human beings awaiting judgment. Uh, so uh, next question. If the Nephilim were destroyed before the flood and only their spirits are left today, why are they considered guardian spirits? And I think that uh, we were talking about Assyrians considered them guardian spirits um so why would they be considered guardian spirits because those guys worship them as um gods we have the same kind of thing in the first century a.d you've got the gnostics uh like simon magus menander you know carpocrates things like that they all worshipped this, and they had a twisted way of looking at, at these things. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, was evil. And Genesis 6 records this idea of creator angels. These are good guys, you know, instead of bad guys. So they had kind of a flip on this. Carpocrates, the one that did the Carpocratian Gnostics, he actually said he was a reincarnation of one of those uh, creator angels. 
And of course, to me, that means, yeah, he probably is demon possessed. The guy was a total nut, uh, very corrupt, very immoral, you know, so just normal Gnostics. But the Gnostics did the same thing. They normally worship the 30 eons, but somehow that always went back to Genesis 6. So it's kind of an interesting thing there. So again, they didn't become guardian spirits. It's just that if you're satanic and you're worshiping demons, you think of them that way. Uh, what happened to the 10 that weren't destroyed? Okay, I'm, I may mistype this. What happened to the 10 that weren't destroyed? Yeah, I have no clue. I must have mistyped that one when I put it in here. Um, maybe I meant them. What happened to them or those those that were not destroyed? Um, or the question is, Azazel, was he among them? So the angels, according to Clement, one of the church fathers, said that when the angels came down, they metamorphosized. No longer could they go back up. So they're not just people, but they're not angels in full either. When Peter talks about they left their first estate, a lot of times that's what it says in, in King James. A lot of times we look at that and think, okay, they left their first estate up there and they moved down here, just like you would sell your house and move somewhere else. But that does not, that's not really what the word means. It doesn't mean moving. It means to change status. Um, as a human being, for instance, I could quit my job as a banker and go become a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician, my status would change. I, I was, I'm no longer that here. Or maybe if I was a great minister, but I said I apostatized and I no longer believe, fallen out of grace, you know, and now I'm a, a plumber or something. Uh, my, my whole being has changed. Even if I've moved or whether I've actually moved to a new, new house or not. Um, so that's what we're talking about there. Uh, so Peter says they left their first estate. They were no longer like they were before. They were different. And of course, Peter doesn't give us any details of exactly how or anything like that. It's very interesting to think about, though. And the church fathers, again, there's no major treatise on demons per se, but it's just as they're talking about working with the heathen or doing something, um, they would mention little pieces of things. Uh, so anyway, so Azazel then, uh, so the angels, the wives, and the children are chained up in Tartarus, except for 10%. Oh, that's probably what it is, 10%. The 10%, I didn't put percent in there. But the 10% are of the children, since they are disembodied spirits, are roaming the earth. So I don't think that any of the human beings are or the angels are because it's a totally different thing. Uh, in your book, Fallen Angels, you said Azazel was chained under a valley uh, called Bet Hadudo until Judgment Day. Are the other 200 chained there as well or only, only 90% of them? Well, if I the way I'm reading Enoch, if I'm reading it correctly, and if it's you know, coming correctly from the Ethiopic. Um, all of the angels are chained up somewhere. Uh, Azazel apparently is in a specific place, according to the text is Berhadudo. And it's interesting, you can probably figure out approximately where this is at, because the, the Azazel or scapegoat ritual talks about you start from Jerusalem, and you can only walk a day's Sabbath, which is less than a mile. So you would go out almost a mile to one of the hills and a guy waiting there would take the goat the next phase. And so they would go out, it's either 10 or 12 miles away from Jerusalem to the place where they would kill the scapegoat, um, let it go over the cliff. And that was called Bet Hadudo. And so if it's the same one, it's interesting that he's chained there way down on the earth somewhere. Uh, but the scapegoat ritual kind of points you to him, to what's going on in that place. Now, in Revelation, it says that there are four mighty angels chained under the Euphrates. Now, the Euphrates never gets even close to Bet Hadudo. So they're, they're chained up in various places. So Azazel is in one spot, and um, 
I don't know who the other four are, but there's four chained under, under the Euphrates that will be released sometime in the tribulation period, according to Revelation. And of course, there's quite a few others somewhere else. So good idea. I, I If you think you know a location, I still would not try to go mess around with it because, you know, um, you could you could get yourself into some trouble doing that kind of thing. A lot of you uh, follow or used to follow Chuck Misler and follow also like L.A. Marzulli. He's got a series of videos. Uh, one of the videos was talking about a guy who just decided he would go to these various places and command the spirits to leave and kind of take over and that kind of stuff and got himself into some very serious trouble, almost got himself killed. Not by people, but a demonic attack. So basic idea is if the Lord's telling you to do something and you you're, you're have a ministry in the demonic or something like that, then by all means, do what the Lord's called you to do. If you don't, stay out of it. It's just the, the best thing to do. I like teaching here. I have, and maybe it's just me, but I have absolutely no desire at all to have a prison ministry, for instance. Now, that would probably be much safer than anything else, but I could still possibly get myself in trouble. Uh, or maybe a ministry in an inner city specifically to gangs. That does not sound like something that I need to be a part of. Somebody does. But I'm just saying it's if you're called to it, be faithful. If you're not called to something or you're not sure, pray about it first. Um, let's see here. Okay. Number seven, why was Azazel considered the worst of the other angels, or the worst rather, if other angels taught men to do evil things? Um, he was assigned as the, the kind of the scapegoat that might have a good meaning for that. Basically, it's, it's um, if we have a church and we're teaching all the kids that you, you have to wait till marriage to um, have sex, uh, you have to, uh, ha you know, be all the decent stuff. And then we get one guy that comes in and he makes it well known. He's just living with somebody. Okay. Now, if we all of a sudden say, well, that's kind of an exception, hopefully they'll get married like a lot of churches do. And we don't do anything about it. The kids will see that and think, okay, well, I'm not supposed to, but apparently it's not that big of a deal or he wouldn't be here. So I guess it's okay. And they would go ahead and do whatever they want to do. Um, and so it's that kind of an idea as far as like, uh, it's always been said that whatever you do in moderation, your kids will do to the max. So it's that kind of an idea. So if we have Azazel coming down, he keeps to himself and doesn't really do anything weird. That's one thing, but it still caused the other angels to look and say, he's getting away with it. Apparently, it's not that big of a deal. Let's go do it. And then they cause tons of problems, mess everything up. So with that in mind, then technically, the, per the person that headed this whole thing up that caused the major problem is actually Azazel. So he's the one that uh, the whole sin, that kind of sin is ascribed to according to, I think that's Enoch. Uh, so, yeah, because he taught certain things. Uh, in the book of Enoch, it talks about the leaders of the 200 taught different things to men. And that's one thing that's interesting, because if you look at it, they taught things like sorcery, uh, poisonings, and antidotes to poison. They taught weapons, armor, um, all sorts of things like that. So if you think about it, there's nothing wrong with me building a wall or armor or something for protection. Maybe you would or would not want me to have a sword, but a shield would be a good thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, making a plow or other instruments out of iron, knowing how to metallurge, there's nothing wrong with that. Knowing that something is poisonous and how to, if you accidentally eat it, what can I do to make you well? Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. So we look at these things and we think, okay, sorcery, that's probably bad, but 
The rest of the stuff I don't see a problem with. It's not what they taught per se, but what they did with society. So if you come up to say like an Amish type group and said, your, your guys are weird. You're worshiping a fake God. He doesn't care about you. He's letting you die. Look, we've got medicine. We've got cars. We've got this. We've got that. So we're the right ones. That's going to make people, you know, gravitate to you. And then you start saying your God wants, he doesn't like you. He wants to enslave you. We're going to give you freedom. So switch to our side. So they basically use all of these things that may or may not be good or bad, but just things to get you distracted or away from the Lord. Um, they might even say something like, yeah, Adam is correct. The God he worships is a real being. Adam is an idiot because he's worshiping the being that's a little, you know, we've been there. We saw him. We know. Just follow us. We'll take care of you. So that kind of a con would would really work wonders in destroying a society. And that's basically what they they talked about. Uh, you can you can kind of figure it because um, I forget which one. One of them invented the mirror, the idea of putting something on the back of glass so that you can see yourself and makeup. And the only reason you would do that is to try to start changing the society. If you can get people to say, well, it doesn't matter who you sleep with just do it this way and if you look better than the other person you'll get the guy or the girl that you want and so it's just a way to change the society into what you want it to be um, and apparently was successful the entire old world had to be wiped out of course that was mainly genetic problems according to what they said so it's just because he started the process Question number eight, is Azazel one of the four angels to be released referenced in Revelation 9, 15? Probably not, because those are all under the Euphrates, and he's in a different place. So he's probably not one of them. Someone told me that there's supposedly a female angel named Japhiel mentioned in the Talmud. Is this possible? Uh, according to all the text, no. Um Jophiel, it, it might be a feminine name in some circles and not in others. I mean, even in English, you could have a, a name like Chris. Could be a guy's name, could be a girl's name. Um, and maybe we would spell it differently if it's ma masculine or feminine. Maybe they wouldn't spell it differently. Um, so anyway, the, the text and the, the, the scriptures all seem to point to the idea that there are angels and they are masculine, basically. There are no female angels. Now, once they do the genetic tampering or whatever it was that they did, once that begins, you're gonna have the, the babies will be, some will be male, some will be female. So there are male and female Nephilim, okay? Not angels, but Nephilim tribes. When they were all wiped out, you have these disembodied spirits. So you could be possessed by a Nephilim spirit that is masculine, was masculine a long time ago, or was feminine a long time ago. And that's why you'll get some of these texts that talk about a demoness or a female demon. Um, that's entirely possible, but not angels. Um, so whatever that, and I don't have the reference to this, so I don't know what the Talmud would be referring to. Um, other question is who were the Nicolaitans of Revelation 2.15? And let's uh look at that real quick. In Revelation 2. Oh, I'm in a one that doesn't have it. There we go. 215. Oh, 215. There we go. Um yeah, it's talking about the, the problems in Pergamos, and it says uh, 215, you also have some of them in that church that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I ha hate. Repent, or I will come and take your church. So if the church doesn't fix this problem, uh, the church will be destroyed. And these are good examples. The, the, the seven churches in Revelation, uh, if your church is doing everything that the, in these churches that the Lord says, I'm very pleased, that's great. If you're doing any of the things that the Lord does not like, you need to change that. Because if he destroyed these churches because of it, he could destroy you also. 
we don't allow sin in the church, but at the same time, we want repentance. We've all been there. We've all sinned. Sin is not the issue. Repentance is the issue. But you can't allow sin in the church like we're talking about with uh, the fornicator and what would the kids say. It's going to end up destroying everything. So anyway, the Nicolaitans. Some people have taught that you take the word Nicolaitan and break it up into Nikos and laity. And it means kind of a, a priest laity type breakup or whatever. The thing is, though, that it's basically named after a guy named Nicholas. So the name itself doesn't really mean anything, according to what the early church father said. So let me find this. This is from, this is a page. Hopefully you can see it good. Let me try to get it a little bit bigger here. See if we can do, there we go. That might be too big. That'll work. No. No, it will not. It has to be there. Okay, let me run it down a little bit more. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, anyway, this is from our book, Ancient Church Fathers. And what we did in the Ancient Church Fathers is try to find this kind of stuff. Anything that um, where they taught the gifts continue or, uh, or did they or could you lose your salvation or... Um, how do you interpret certain prophecies? Uh, how do you get saved even? Uh, you know, just different things like that. There's a section on doctrines that are Calvinistic and Roman Catholic and stuff. And what would they say about them? You know, those kind of things. And in this section on Gnosticism, we've got this thing on <clears throat> the Nicolaitans. So here's what it says in Revelation 15 and 16. We just looked at that. But it says... Uh, you all, you have those also in them, in, in that church, that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So you don't want to be on the wrong side of the Lord. So who are these guys? So we have two um, pieces of information, one from Eusebius and one from Victor. So about two... 40, 280, and the other one's 325. Eusebius, if you, if you follow me now, is the father of church history. So in book three, he mentions these guys. And he says, this sect, this cult, basically, took its name after Nicholas, one of the seven deacons of Acts. And then he gives you this explanation. Nicholas didn't have anything to do with them. Okay. Uh, they were influenced by the Gnostics and they began practicing adultery and eating meat offered to idols in order to prove they had conquered the flesh. Now, there's a couple of other <coughs> points that some of the church fathers bring out about this. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. There's, there was a cult called the Nicolaitans. There was also a cult called the Manatheans. And it was after Nicholas and Matthias, two of the two of the people. So apparently, it was really interesting. The church fathers were saying they had this phrase, like we're all famous for catchphrases. Ken always says whatever, so it's a famous quote, you know, or whatever. Well, they had this famous quote. They both used the same phrase, and it was uh, that we should abuse the flesh. Now, in Greek, that sounds quite a bit different than in English. And it was obvious they're talking about like when Paul says you buffet the flesh in order to bring it to subjection. I'm not supposed to get drunk. I'm not supposed to fornicate. I'm not supposed to do certain things. So I will do whatever it takes to make my body do what I want it to do. I bring it into subjection. So that's what they're meaning. But you could very easily flip that around and say, abuse the flesh. Oh, I could abuse it a certain way I'm thinking of. And that's kind of how they took it. So one thing I thought was really interesting in reading Eusebius is that we have to be careful how we say things. I need to communicate something to you so that you know uh, he, he was very clear. You don't do this. I know it would be horrible if you could listen to me and think, was, is he saying to do it or not to do it? Hmm, maybe it's not that bad of an idea. And then I've caused someone to sin. And so that was kind of what they were talking about here. We have to watch our speech. 
Paul even says the same thing, I think, in Romans, Romans or Corinthians. He talks about you have to make sure that you're, you're all of the same speech. So we do that today. We have uh, like a cult will come and say, I believe in the Trinity. I believe there's three guys, three guys. That's not the definition of a Trinity. So don't lie, <laughs> you know, but then I might think, well, I think the Trinity is like this and I'm just trying to explain it. And you think, oh, Ken's a heretic, you know, well, am I or not? I mean, let, let's pinpoint what exactly do I think that means? And if I say, well, it's this, 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 and this, then you'd say, oh, okay, he's all right then. You, you said it funny. Don't say it funny. You're going to make people think some, something's weird. Like I had this one lady came up to me one time and said, do you believe in a rapture? And I said, yeah. She's like, oh, okay. Well, I don't, but that's okay. I'm like, oh, this is weird. This is in a Calvary chapel. So I'm like, I excuse me, what do you think Paul meant in like, First Thessalonians, I mean, yeah, First Thessalonians 4, about the catching away. Do you think that's the second coming? Do you think Paul lied? What do you, I mean, how do you? And she says, oh, no, I believe in the, the catching away. I just think it happens at the second coming. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Basically, when you say, I don't believe in a rapture, we're thinking you're saying Paul's a liar. So don't, don't say it that way. Just say you believe in a post-trib rapture. And she was okay with that. She's like, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's that's what I meant. I'm like, okay. And then I, I spent a couple minutes talking to her about if it's a post-trib rapture, uh, things like who repopulates the planet? Oh, I didn't think about that. Well, I'm probably more of a mid-trib person. And I said, okay, that's fine. And I just left it because that that's good enough for the time being. I had to go do something. But it's she, she wasn't that far off. She wasn't cultic. She wasn't really weird. She just didn't communicate it right. So that's what we got to be really careful. And first, we'll make sure that we're saying the same thing before we holler and say somebody's a cult or whatever. So anyway, this is what he says about it. Uh, so they misquote Nicholas and Matthias and say that they, they, they want us to do these things. And they started this little cult at it. One of them was that they practiced adultery, and the other was that they ate meat offered to idols. A little more interesting, when you get to Victor, he's, uh, he's doing a commentary on the book of Revelation. That may be off. I was thinking it was 240. Anyway, in the 200s, he writes this commentary. And he says this, the works of the Nicolaitans were at that time false and troublesome men who, as ministers under the name of Nicholas, had made themselves a heresy to the effect that what they had what had been offered to idols might be exercised and eaten and whosoever should have committed fornication might receive peace on the eighth day so this is loaded with information number one notice this if you can take meat and offer it to an idol then if I exercise it and eat it and I'm okay, you're basically saying if I didn't exercise it, exercise meanings to kick the demon out. If I didn't do that and then I ate the meat, the implication is that I could be possessed, right? So number one, they're teaching that Christians could be possessed, which is not possible because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be oppressed, but we can't be possessed in, in that sense. So, um, and basically they're teaching people to participate in idolatry. Now, if you go to a store and you pick up a steak and you don't know if that was secular or where the steak came from, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, don't worry about it. Idols are dumb idols. We don't care. Don't waste food. But if someone comes and says that's been messed around, I mean, that's from a cult or whatever then throw it away. It's the person, that other person's conscience is more important than food. And so, but at the same time, you would not go to a shrine of a false God and do a pagan ritual to get a free steak. A lot of people would, Christians will not. That's, that's inappropriate. That's disrespect to our, our God. Uh, so um, they're doing rituals to 
pagan rituals, okay? They believe Christians can be possessed. And this whole concept of whatever sin is committed or the fornication might receive peace on the eighth day. This is really interesting. It gives you the concept of a ritual done on eighth day would be Monday, you know, but whatever. Uh, one day a week, basically, you would come in, do a ritual, and the sins would be forgiven. It sounds like a confessional or a confessing to a priest. Otherwise, who knows if you did the ritual or not. So it's it's really interesting. It kind of sounds a little bit like Roman Catholics. Uh, and Gnostics had that same kind of a stuff, but they went way off a totally different direction with that stuff. So I'm not slamming Catholics. I'm just saying it sounds like it could be Gnostic or it could be Roman Catholic or something else. But this is the basic idea. So they're practicing fornication and pagan things. Apparently, they believe that Christians can be demon possessed and that you can do a ritual that would take care of sin. And of course, the, the Lord simply says, just stop, stop sinning. You don't need to prove anything. You need to prove that you can stop sinning. Don't mess with idols. Just don't do it. So anyway, that's um, from that place here. That's on the Nicolaitans. Okay, I think that's all the questions that I had there. Uh, so at this point, I'll go to the um, chat room and see if there's any other questions about that. It's really fascinating to study prophecy and then also study the demonic. At a certain point, they kind of come together because there's prophecies about the end times and things that happen. Uh, first off was, could you reference the Targum passages, please? Yeah, the um, again, this is Esword, and... Um, we went to Genesis 6, verse 4, that talks about that. And if you go to the, the Targum, it says these two angels fell from heaven in that particular verse. And if you go, let me run down here. If you go to BibleFacts.org, let me back up from here. So here's our front page. And we're you know watching something from one of our broadcasts. You go to File under Resources, under Files and eSword, or if you're using MySword, it should be there too. Conversion files is basically, this is a thing, it's a little automated script that someone created to uh, uh, convert eSword to MySword, that, you know, back and forth, so other things like that. But go to eSword, again, you can pick the program up here and other things here. You can even buy stuff here, like if you wanted the NASV or the NIV or, or something that's under copyright, you can pay $10 or whatever and get it and put it in your eSword. So I've done that to, I think, New King James, Complete a Jewish Bible, and something else. But they have tons of stuff that's all free, too. So anyway, uh, eSword files. All the way at the bottom is Targum. So, and go back to here. Genesis 6, 4 in the Targum says that these two angels were on the earth in those days. And then we were also looking, if you're talking about the other one, I think it was Genesis 35, 21, I think. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I got it read. That's good. Same thing. If you just pick that up from here, you'll have all this. Genesis 25, 31 is when Jacob went past the Tower of Edar, and then it gives the prophecy about the Messiah occurring. So that's Genesis 35, 21. So, okay. Next question. Uh, Greek says that which is our future forms and what angels left. So angels could take human women. Uh, apparently. Uh, they didn't actually say anything. The only thing that it said is that they were in angelic form. And they have some sort of spirit and body thing. It's not like they're a disembodied spirit, like a human ghost or a demon spirit. They are their own thing. Okay. So, but when they came down, they metamorphosized into a certain form. They left that first estate. And so when we go to heaven, we'll be in the other estate. Maybe not exactly like them, but something similar to Christ will be immortal. And we won't have marriage in heaven, basically, is what the Lord says. 
So somehow they were able to do that. So whether they actually did that themselves or just messed with the, with the um, uh, genetics somehow, the, the one we did a few weeks back, we talked about, there's the Book of Giants, and that's a Dead Sea Scroll. And it talks about how they did the genetic tampering. They would take um, similar life forms, mate them together, and they gave examples of like sheep with goats or horses with donkeys to make mules, that kind of a thing. And so if you mix similar life forms that you can, it then creates a, some sort of an unstable life form. And you take two or three of these unstable life forms, put them together. If you knew what you were doing, it would be really easy to just follow directions and it would create, think of it like as a cook. I, I don't know anything about cooking. So there's no way I could make a chocolate cake. I have no way to figure out how to do that. But if I have the recipe, I can go to the store and get this brand, this, and I can follow directions and put one tablespoon. Hopefully, I get if I do do it right. I, if the directions are very specific, I should be able to just follow directions and get a chocolate cake. Okay, so this is the same kind of deal. They already knew how to do this and figured this out. Now, later on, um, after the flood, according to Jubilees, I think it's Jubilees, Canaan is the one that goes and finds the records of the watchers and tries to simply follow directions and is somewhat successful because we've got the giants in the land of Canaan shortly thereafter. So kind of an interesting thing like that. So whether they did that and or mated with women or however they did that, they managed to create new life forms, which is the problem of Genesis 6. Uh, is Genesis 3.15 connected with Genesis 6.4? women's seed and serpent seed. A lot of people think so. I mean, it's obviously talking about the seed of the woman is the Messiah. So that goes all the way down through Mary. And it's also kind of saying the seed of the woman rather than the seed of the man, Joseph. So that's a hint of a virgin birth too. But yeah, obviously the Messiah, sinless Messiah to be our sacrifice comes through that. So the serpent's seed uh, bites his heel, but he crushes its head. So it's basically a, a prophecy about him overcoming all this stuff. Now, whether we're talking about Nephilim connected or just Satan, we don't know. But since the woman's seed is actually a virgin birth, the serpent's seed kind of sounds like it might be the Antichrist. And some people have said that, you know, maybe the Antichrist is a Nephilim. Uh, either way, I mean, even if the he's just a human being that's possessed by a demonic spirit that would make him a nephilim you know maybe not physically but that's what a nephilim is so something along those lines um they may be connected they may not be i'm not not exactly sure it's interesting to think about though because it's it, it's not just there for poetry the very very specific thing that the woman's seed is messiah and apparently women don't have seeds, so that would be a virgin birth. So if it's that specific, and then you're talking about the seed of the serpent, that's got to be, again, something very specific. Um, do you know who Doug Reeds was? If so, what's your opinion? Don't I don't think I remember the name. So no, I guess I don't. Uh, do you think that when Jesus said the end would be like in the days of Noah, that he meant simply that things would seem normal, as it seems to say, or that he meant Nephilim uh, would return in full force? I'm not exactly sure, uh, but we can look and see kind of what's going on. Uh, obviously, things are normal. And uh, he, the part where he describes it, that they're, they're marrying and giving in marriage eating and drinking, just like they were then until the day they entered the ark. So it's the point that we don't believe you or we don't want to believe you. So we'll just continue to do the things we want to do. Conquer people, get married, uh, eat food, get drunk, whatever it is that we're doing. Just continue in sin. We ignore all that stuff. 
Um, the whole idea of the Nephilim comeback, I don't know that he necessarily means that directly, but we do see that because we see after the flood, like I was saying, Canaan, finding the records and reproducing the same effect. And now you've got giants in the land of Canaan. Now, they may not be as powerful or as good, or they may have problems than the pre-flood giants did, but they were pretty fierce to, to come against. And there were multiple post-flood clans. So there was like the Anakim, the Raphaim. Uh, they were all types of Nephilim. Uh, but there were several subgroups. The Zuzamim, I think. There was like four or five different groups. Um, or actually more than that. Um, and then... Um, but with that in mind, we're doing the same thing now. We're messing with genes. We've been able to... We're doing it a totally different way, I guess. But we've mapped out the human genome. And we're beginning to think, well, if we plug this in and plug this in and change this and change that, we can eliminate disease. And that's going to be disastrous. I mean, maybe in time you could figure it out and make it perfect. But every time you make something new, uh, even if it works fairly well, there's always side effects. And a lot of times with... I got to be careful saying this because if I say the wrong thing, I might get in trouble on YouTube. But uh, you make the wrong stuff um it can cause some serious side effects now in time you could work it out and maybe make a perfectly good cure for something um but we just we're talking about what the prophecies say <clears throat> so we have to be careful with that um i i don't think they're going to re return in full force in that sense but i could be wrong but the technology is definitely here and it makes me wonder because I was in the back of the book of Enoch, we have a, a an appendix saying, and of course this was put together like eight, 10 years ago. Back then, the things they were doing, like putting the uh, gene of a jellyfish into like a, a cat and a mouse and uh, a, a gibbon monkey, I think. And they actually got them to glow, you know, because that's what that gene does. And so the whole idea of, of tampering with stuff like that that may or may not have done any damage to anybody, but that's where we were going with that. And so the creations from that, and I, we have uh, a Nephilim study we did a little further back, a month or two back, on Genesis 36. There is a thing in Genesis 36 that sounds funny, but you don't realize what it is. And when you read the account from Jasher, it gives you the entire story. And it's talking about running into Nephilim creatures uh, in the days of Esau. So it's an interesting, interesting thing. I need to redo that one sometime because we actually found, found a steli with a carving of that particular incident. So, okay, next question. I heard some of the testament of our Lord that you shared last week. I saw that the Lord also mentions in the end times children being born old. I recall you mentioned this in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Yeah, it's in like four or five different places. Two or three scrolls, uh, a couple of the church fathers. I think it's mentioned in the Sibylline Oracles and a couple of other places. The idea is that aging continues uh, or the degrading of aging. So if you look at it, pre-flood, we lived to be about seven to nine hundred years Post-flood, instantly, lifespans are cut in half. You only live to be about 400. Now, that 400 only goes four or five generations max. And then something, we don't know what, but something happens. And then now, getting to 220 would be very difficult. So, you go from the fours to the twos. You get cut in half again. And then things tend to go down. Abraham made it to 175. I think Isaac was 160-something. And then the, the, the kids of uh, Jacob all lived to be about 120 to 130. And the standard, when the Essenes, with their herbal medicine, continued to live to 120. That was a standard for them, even up in the first century, where Gentiles were living to be about 60, and rabbis were living to be about 70, a little, little bit longer. Uh, Essenes were still the 110 to 120 mark. 
uh, which is one reason why we really, really want to get a full copy of this Hagi, this herbal medicine book that they have or had, or try to recreate some of these things. Again, we're not talking about Nephilim medicine, which we need to stay away from, but we're talking about how to enhance our, you know, slow down the aging process. And that's got to be something with foods and supplements and that kind of stuff. Uh, so yes, actually it's several places, but the idea then is that the average person lives to be about 80 or 70, 70 to 80 is, is probably pretty good. And that's kind of the way it is now. Um, but there are several texts that talk about something happens because of the wickedness of our age. So it, it's almost like because of greed, somebody's doing something with food or air or something. They didn't say that, but it kind of something about because of their own wickedness, this stuff happens. But um, something happens according to the tax and lifespans get cut in half again. So you'd be graying instead of graying at 50 and living to 100. You'd be graying at 20 and living to 40. And it talks about um, uh, giving birth a lot sooner. So if you look at Genesis, um, <clears throat> when they were living to be 900 years old, they seem to be having their kids when they're about 130, 135, something like that. So now we could live to be 90, say that's about the best we could do. Somebody that just hits puberty could probably have a baby at say 13 and a half, 13, 14. So that, that's a possibility. So the whole thing seems to have went down 135 and 900 to 13 and 90. Don't recommend that, but I'm just saying that's so with that in mind, if the 90 goes down to 50 or 40, then, you know, I don't the 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 whole thing sounds weird. They start giving birth much younger. Babies seem to be old when they're born. And that could be symbolic of something else. But they, there are several texts that say that. And it just gives you this concept of something happening. And every time that's happened, the flood it was an instant thing, cut in half. Uh, four generations later, whatever happened, instant thing, cut in half. Um, and so this seems to be kind of the same thing. Something happens. I don't know if it would be a nuclear thing or a chemical thing or a, a DNA thing problem or whatever, but something seems to be. So, it, and again, those things are extra biblical, so we don't know for sure. But the fact that there's four or five different places giving basically the same detail is something to actually wonder about. Oh, one of those, one of those particular passages talking, talks about how uh, um, we get to the place where women could give birth at four months. And I remember a time way back when, when seven months was very iffy. Now that's very common. Six months is kind of iffy. Five is probably not going to make it four is you know but i've been talking to a few i i in the prophecy watchers conference i did was talking about this and hagi herbal medicine and stuff from the scrolls and mentioned some of those prophecies there were a few people that said if you go to a special neonatal type hospital up in a large city they have the ability to it's really iffy but possibly in the fourth month somewhere so we're getting close to that, but that's that's um, medical technology, being able to breathe for the baby until the baby can use its lungs. That's different from the baby being born at four months and being like it's a nine month baby. So that's kind of what the text seems to imply, but it's hard to tell. Very interesting to look at that stuff. If someone says he is to love and to believe in Jesus, but he says he is not God and there is no son, that belief isn't relevant to salvation. The Bible is just a telephone game, etc. Is there hope that he's saved? Uh, I wouldn't think so. Jesus made the comment that if you don't believe that I am, you die in your sins. And the whole idea of believing in Jesus is to believe what he said. So we have the Bible. 
the Bible says, you know, what Jesus said, you have to believe that I am. It, it's, it's not saying that I am the one or I am the guy or something like that. The word I am is a, uh, uh, an idiom kind of meaning God, the self-existent one. You see that in Genesis chapter three, when Moses says, well, when I go back and tell him God wants to free him, who do I say is freeing him? I mean, what name do I call you to them so that they will know you're their God and just give me a name? And God says, I am who I am. You tell them I am sent you. You know, and that's just his name. So when Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am, you die in your sins. Now, granted, we had the Essenes believing Messiah was God incarnate, the rabbis thinking that he was just a guy. And so there's this di dichotomy. And a lot of people thinking, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll either be doing miracles or symbolic. We'll just see, you know, okay, the Messiah came and you've seen now. You've seen all the prophecies being fulfilled literally. He was really born in a city called Bethlehem. It was all literal. So follow directions. And if you refuse to believe in it, then you refuse. Messiah is the only means of salvation. Jesus says, I've come, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. And if he says, if you don't believe that I am, you die in your sins, that's pretty specific. Now, hopefully I'm misinterpreting that. I mean, it, you know, it would be nice but that's not something you can count on. Anybody like that, we need to try to talk to them that you, you're not a Christian unless you're a follower of Christ. And to follow Christ, it doesn't mean that you do it perfectly. I mess up and, you know, stub my toe or cuss or something, so I've sinned. But I don't want to do that. I don't practice any sin. I try to do what's right because I'm trying to follow what Jesus taught. Now, if I, if I misunderstand... That's one thing. But he made it very clear. I mean, all through the scriptures, uh, Paul said the, the uh, fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him in bodily form. Everything that God is was there in Christ. I don't know how you get anything else out of that, the idea of a trinity. So, yeah, I, that's, that's a guy that I'm not sure is saved. Uh, now, he might be saying that just to you know, say that. But then again, if he's really saved, you wouldn't be playing games like that either. Concerning the Sedim, the, okay, the, the Inuit people have a sea goddess named Sedna, hmm, who they say was fathered by two giants at the beginning of the world. Could Sedna be the Sedim? Could this be the same entity as Rahab? That's interesting. That that's always a possibility. We got to be careful though, because with the languages, just because I use the word Sadim and someone else does doesn't necessarily mean it's the exact same thing. And so a lot of um like Pan Babylonian groups get that mi mixed up. This sounds like Easter or Ishtar or Easter, therefore they must be the same goddess. Maybe, maybe not if it's from different languages. So we got to be careful doing that. But it is interesting when something is very similar like that, especially since it's a, a sea goddess, because that whole idea of the pre-flood world is on the other side of the sea, the way the different histories might write it. On the other side of the sea, on the other side of the flood, the other side of history. So there's this Sedna. That, that is very interesting. I would do some more research with that and see if there's any more uh, details. I mean, if you got three or four or five different details that fit exactly, it's got to be a memory of Azazel and Nema. If it's just that one word, probably a coincidence, but it'd be interesting to look at. <clears throat> How many different places are there? Uh, are the, are these bad and or fallen entities in? Um, well, as far as like the the demonic host, they're they're in a, in one place called Tartarus. As far as the angels, they are somewhere on the planet, but they're chained. 
All we know for sure is that Azazel is in a place called Beth Hadudo, which is closer to Jerusalem than the Euphrates. And that there are supposed to be four angels chained under the Euphrates that are going to be released during the tribulation period. So there's at least four in that one spot. And to say there's four over there would lead you to believe there's not four over there plus five or six or seven. I'm assuming only four or at least only four that are released. But so and there's 200 angels that came down according to Enoch. So if that number 200 is correct, uh, Azazel is a different group. <clears throat> so Azazel is one, four are under the Euphrates. So there's another hundred and some somewhere. So don't know other, anything other than that, though. Interesting question. Um, how do we get the Targum file from your website and install it to your own eSword program? You just click on it and download it. And what you'd want to do with all anything that's a uh, let me let me gra grab it here so we can see. This is a this is a BBLX. So anything like that's a Bible. So you just click on it and it should come up and see now I can save it. So what you'd want to do if I didn't have it, I would go to. Um, this is a PC, so it's um, uh, this PC C, and I think it's eighty six. Yeah, there's eSword. So click on that, and th that's where all the Bibles are at. So just save this there. Then you'd have to exit out of Resword, out of eSword rather, and then back into it. And then it should just show up in your thing. You can do this with, see, I've got the new King James, King James Plus, ISV. That's that other one that I bought. Uh, Hebrew, Targum, and then the uh, Tectus Receptus Interlinear. So just any of those you just throw in there. Make sure they're safe. Things on my site have been scanned with viruses. You can get them on uh, biblesupport.com, this place here, including ones you can buy. So very interesting thing. So there's a lot of stuff here if you're interested that you can get a, a copy of. I'm new here. Jubilees, dated to 100 BC, states that Noah's wife, Noah's wife's name rather is Amzara. And that she is the daughter of his father's brother. So she was a cousin. Uh, why go with Jasher, which is from the 1600s? Um, the, the book of Jubilees that we have is um, from the Ethiopic. And when you compare the dates, for instance, the dates are all off. The names are all different, uh, mainly different. Um, and that's just because going through the different languages. So if you look at that, M Zara, uh, M is a Hebrew word for, for um, people. Zara is seed. So it's interesting. Her, her name in this is the seed of my people. So yes, she's, she's a close relative. So cousin, you know, niece, great cousin, second cousin, something like that. Um, and she is the daughter of his father's brother. So that would probably be right. So, yeah, it's just one of those things. Now, Jasher has all of the, uh, the, it's from the Hebrew. So it's all from that. All of the numbers from Jasher, uh, like the chronology, the dates and stuff, match the Hebrew Masoretic text of Genesis we have in our Bibles, like the King James. And it also matches the, the Genesis that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's the same thing like if you were if you would be using a Septuagint, the Greek Bible. Stories are the same. Sometimes the names are different. That doesn't really mean much. But the numbers can be way off also. And in Jubilees, I mean, I like Jubilees, uh, but it will start with Genesis and it'll get to the place where it's 300 years off from Genesis. But then you can see somebody edited it because it starts going back. And when you get from, from creation to the, I think, death of Jacob or Joseph, one of those guys, um, it's actually only a year different from the, the Genesis that we have. So you can tell somebody got off and then someone else tried to correct it. So it's, it's interesting in that. Uh, Enoch is the same way. There were pieces of it that sounded funny. We were trying to use it to figure out the calendar, for instance. 
And then when we find pieces of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it made perfect sense on how it was said. And you, and you can tell why they said it a certain way. So um, it's just kind of a preference. I, I've, I have good friends that follow the Septuagint. Their dating and number system is totally different. But I'm trying to find texts that agree with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text. <clears throat> and hopefully they give more information, but the numbers and the names should be very close. Good question, though. Always got to be careful with that stuff. There are no older copies, or are there no older copies of Jasher in the Dead Sea Scrolls? There is no book of Jasher. Or is there? Okay. It seems to be a medieval forgery. There's actually three or four different versions of it, and several of them are medieval forgeries. But uh, the text originally comes from the uh, Sephardic Jews. Uh, the history is supposedly is that the people that came from the temple brought that particular record to the Sephardic Jews. That's been kept for quite a while. Uh, there is a first century rabbi, first century AD. Yeah, first century AD rabbi named Eliezer, who quotes from Jasher quite a lot in his chronology type stuff. Um, so that gives us the idea that Jasher was, even if it's a forgery, it's at least 2,000 years old, if not in, instead of like four or 500. And that's the way it is with all this stuff. If you were to ask me, if you were to tell me, for instance, Habakkuk in the Old Testament is a forgery, it's fake, it's not real. You know, how could I go about proving it? Well, the earliest copy of the scriptures we've had has been 1000 AD. So that's as far back as I can prove it. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls come along. We have a copy of that. It goes all the way back to maybe 100, 200 BC. That's much closer, much, much closer. But still, that's four or five hundred, five or six hundred years after Habakkuk wrote that. So that's five or six hundred years where something could be edited or, or garbled. So I can't really prove anything like that. The only thing I can prove is we can date some of these things and know they're at least from the Middle Ages, at least from the first century AD, at least from this, you know, and it may or may not go further back. So that's a good question. We always want to remain skeptical of this stuff. And even if this is an accurate uh, version of Jasher from up. It still doesn't mean that the English translations we have uh, might have been tampered with or whatever. It's always a possibility. It's the same with Josephus. Josephus should be 100% perfect, I would assume, from his what he wrote, that is, what he believed and wrote from the first century. But I think there's a few places where numbers are off. Um, well, his basic chronology is off, and he tries to summarize it in a couple of places and gives us two or three different versions. Somehow, numbers and animals and crystals, like a, a red crystal, is it a garnet or is it a ruby? Things like that. I don't know why, but crystals, animals, and numbers tend to always get garbled somehow. So, uh, yeah, the oldest copy of Jasher we would have or quotes from it go from the first century AD. Now, if it's legitimate, it should be all the way back to 35, 3,500 years, so like 1500 BC. It should be about the same time period as Genesis. Question, can spiritual, educated Christian filled with the Holy Spirit control demonically suppressed people and to help them like some Solomon did in building the temple. I had a demon suppressed man help me after prayer. Okay. Um, the de demonic stuff, I'm not exactly sure how that goes. I mean, according to the church fathers, if you're filled with the spirit and you walk into a place where it's demonically, they do rituals or something, <clears throat> the ability for everything to work just stops because the Holy Spirit's present. And the church fathers talk about this and many, give many stories of how that happened. Uh, so, but now if you're living with someone, uh, for instance, or like maybe you got a son or a daughter or a roommate or something, and they're playing around with some sort of demonic thing, 
um, the demon may want to be with them and you may have a hard time making it stay away. So I don't know exactly how that works myself, um, but it's it's an interesting thing. Number one, we should not be living with someone that's possessed. And I know that seems hard and everything, but it's just like we're also not supposed to be living with someone who's getting drunk or fornicating or transgender or anything like that. So if they're committing sin, you need to leave or make them leave or something. We really shouldn't be unequally yoked with people like that, even if they're related to us. They need to understand it's a pretty serious thing. That goes back to that whole concept we were talking about, someone walking in the church and we allow it. Uh, and then the kids saying, well, I know it's a really bad thing, but apparently it's not that big of a deal. And so that's how you can possibly get in trouble. Um, last question. I have a question. Are there pictures in Egyptian art of people with bird heads, actual hybrids? Yeah, that I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to tell for sure either. Um, they could have been trying to do that kind of thing. It could be symbolic. Um, they have a lot of gods that they worship, like goddess with a cat head. Uh, Horus is like has a bird head, things like that. So where they got those images or why they wanted to depict them that way, not sure. But it's also it's it's a possibility. OK, well, it's an 830, so we will stop there for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed this. This has just been kind of a not an in-depth study on the scrolls or anything in particular, but kind of a rehash of with some of the questions we did from three weeks back, I think it is. Nephilim studies are fascinating, especially going through with Genesis, um, Jasher, uh, Enoch, Jubilees, uh, the church fathers in general, all the quotes and the things that they talk about. So we'll go ahead and stop there. We'll come back next week. Um, remember, next week, uh, we have a Bible study at my home on Tuesdays, and so we'll be having our Takufa to celebrate, focus on repentance, prophecy, uh, and fellowship. Following Monday is um, Christmas. We'll probably upload something, and because I won't be here live on Christmas. But uh, next uh, next year, next month, we'll start up uh, and start doing things. Um, I think actually, I think new yeah New Year's is a Monday too, so we might not. We'll have something on those two, but I probably won't be here live on those two holidays. Anyway, we will see you uh, next week and continue our studies. God bless you guys. We'll see you later.